Satan's strategy in the deep church. You heard me right, the deep church. Well, okay, where does Satan's strategy begin? Let's go all the way back to Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of, the, of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Okay, so while Blavatsky is given, um, is given the start, the genesis of the New Age movement, it actually started here in Genesis 3. Just to be super clear, the New Age movement and the deep church of lies started right here in Genesis 3. So keep that in mind as we go through church history here and we go through the Bible. So this video is to save one New Ager out there from believing and the lies right here, Satan's strategy begins in Genesis 3. You will be like gods. You, we are all one. We are all one God under the Christ consciousness, knowing good and evil. You will be as the light bearer, for that's what Lucifer's name mean, light bearer. Okay, yeah, and then he fell. <laughs> okay, it's that's super simple. He fell in Genesis 1 verse two and Jeremiah describes it in Jeremiah four that's for another day in another video this video is for the new ager unbeknownst to them actually new agers just mean you're pagans all right you're, you're pagan and you're worshiping pagan gods but see that gets all covered over with people like Blavatsky I mean it it's so old it's so deep the church is so deep. The church is deeper than the state. It's older. The roots are twisted and perverted and they go down to the core of the earth. That's why the earth has to be destroyed. The earth and the heavens will one, one day just be a gigantic fireball. Everything will be destroyed because of this lie that started in Genesis 3. Now well, let's look at some of it. What is pagan worship all about? It's about worshiping the sun, the moon, and the stars, which are to say divination, psychic readings, tarot card readings. Astrology is the largest of all of the divinations. Of all of the divinations, astrology is number one because that's what the Tower of Babel is about. Getting closer to the stars so you can study the celestial objects in space. So now, Anything that you do, every ceremony on planet Earth is a pagan ceremony. There's no way around, we, we only know paganism. There's no history, there's no culture that wasn't pagan worshiping little G. It doesn't exist. The truth does not exist in the history of this world. The truth does not exist in the history of the church. The only truth that exists is the King James Bible, the King James version of the Bible. I'm gonna make part two of this video today. Part two is going to be giving you the history of the Bible and understanding how radically it was protected and how people would, had to die. If you were caught trafficking Bibles back in the day, you were killed for that. You were martyred for that. So that'll be part two. But let me just go through the deep church and the pagan worshiping. Now, Paul knows it. It's going on in Paul's day. He's surrounded by it. His heart is stirred. His spirit is stirred in Acts, as he's standing there in Athens. But let's read what Paul tells, tells us in Romans 1, 22 to 25. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of their incorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible men, to birds, namely the Roman eagles, the owls, and the ravens, the predator birds that eat unclean things, unclean birds. So they, they worship a lot of birds. Rome had eagles everywhere. Eagle is an offense to God, just to be super clear. 
it is an offense. And we turn it around. We just don't know any better. We're not educated. We're not educated. This country, I'm going to go through how, how pagan this country is, United States. Okay, so let's finish what, what Paul said here. They started worshiping birds and four-footed beasts, namely bulls and goats, four-footed beasts, and creepy things, all things Gothic, whatever, whatever you want to think on that. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the dust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever and ever. Amen. So who is the creature they're worshiping? Mother Earth. The New Agers call it Gaia. Gaia. Tree huggers. So the Bible is full of pagan worshiping, pagan gods. The main one is Baal. Of course, you guys all know Baal and Baal Peor, right? And then there's Asherah, to name just a few. I've talked a lot about this on other videos, but I want to put an emphasis now because I have I was in a conversation with a person that's not in the word. Let's just say that. And um, wanted to counter the anointing of the Bible. And so I thought, you know what? Let me let me educate myself on that and let me do some Bible history study. So that's what I'm bringing you today. This is what I found so far. A month from now, will I know more? Probably. I continue to mature in the Holy Spirit. All right, so the Old Testament was written over the course of over 2,000 years. And I say over 2,000 years because we do not know who wrote Job. I personally, and it's just me personally, think it was God himself. But we do not know who wrote Job. And we do know that Job is the oldest book in the Bible. It was written before the five books of Moses. That we know. And, and, and the Bible was pulled together, right? The, the scrolls came together in the days of Ezra. And Jesus quotes from his prophets of the Old Testament, which means that he authenticates the entire Old Testament for us. So if Jesus quotes from the prophets in the Old Testament, enough said. It's done. It's over. It's authenticated. Jesus says it's anointed. Period. We either believe Jesus or we don't. And I do. So I don't need to, I don't need it to, to say any more about that, that part of it. So let's look at, all right, then who wrote the Bible? Were they all anointed? Yes, they were all anointed. Let's start. So pagans, New Agers, New Agers don't like to be called pagans, by the way. They, they like to be called, I don't know what they're called, Gai, Gaians? Or since they, they love Mother Earth, Gaia, and they do all kinds of ceremonies to her and the moon and, and, and you know, portals and door, whatever astrology BS of the month is. They do all kinds of ceremonies to those, not only astrology uh, components each month, you can find some astrology thing to worship each month, but also they, they worship combination of numbers like 1111, 444. It's all pagan. It's all been done. There's nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun. It's been going on since God made the earth. It's been going on since Genesis 1-2. The, the devil and his angels came down to earth and was given title deed for a certain amount of time. They still have title deed not only of the earth, but of us. They can do whatever they want to us. Now, is there a, uh, what do you call that, governor on the devil? Yeah. Until the last three and a half years of the last seven years of planet Earth, the governor is removed. So are they restrained? Yeah, they're restrained to some degree, but there's a lot they can do. Trust me, there's a lot the angels did to me, the dark angels did to me, my entire life. Not just a few abductions. We're talking continually, weekly, my entire life. No, I wasn't one of the lucky ones that just got abducted three times, impregnated, and the baby took it. No, I didn't get that lucky. I didn't just get a few abductions. 
I got a lifetime with them. And that there's a reason for that. There's that there's that's an anointing. It's my anointing to bring to you the supernatural and the story about the angels that no one else is bringing. They've been churched away from that. So I will return the supernatural before the last days are here so you understand the holy hell that you are going to be in in the last days if you're not in the word of God. If you're going to a church, the deep church. All right. Yes, the Bible is completely inspired directly from God's anointed. Okay, so let's get into it. The first five books is written by the prophet Moses. Then, after Moses dies, God assigns Joshua as the prophet on the death of Moses. And Moses is the only body in which God sends forth Archangel Michael to collect. And wherever Michael took him, we're not told, but Satan tries to wrestle with Michael. Michael says, the Lord rebuke you. Go read that in Jude 9. Then we have the first and second judges. That... Uh, not only the first and second judges, but Ruth, right? And that's written by prophet Samuel. Now Samuel writes on the first and second judges, Ruth, and the first part of his life until chapter 25. And in chapter 25, Samuel dies. And there's two prophets of God underneath Samuel. And they take up and write the red, finish out First Samuel and, and also write Second Samuel. Those two prophets are called Nathan and Gad, G-A-D, Gad. So that Nathan and Gad picks up the rest, rest of Samuel. Then First and Second Chronicles is written by Ezra, in which the king in Esther's timeline, um, it's cause of First and Second Chronicles is being read to him. Um, leads to this gigantic revolt and of the Jews. Anyways, there's a whole Jewish story. We'll get to that when we get to Esther. So First and Second Chronicles is written by Ezra. Ezra is a priest and a Torah scholar. Again, anointed. And Ezra will combine efforts with Nehemiah and bring about a huge revival. Again, there's a celebration, see Nehemiah 8, 13 to 18, and read Ezra 3. The entire timeline of Ezra and Nehemiah is prophecies that were given by Jeremiah in, in chapter 31, and also Ezekiel chapter 36, which authenticates this period in, in the Old Testament. Then we have Esther, right? She's going to become the new queen of Persia. She and Mordecai will be the only hope for the Jewish people in the end. The Jewish people will win the battle against Haman and all their enemies, and Esther and Mordecai will establish a two-day feast named Purim for their deliverance. The whole message in Esther, because God's never mentioned in Esther, it is that the message here is that God will use the mess of the immoral behavior going on in this day under this king, Asher Shura, I can't pronounce his name. It was something like that. It starts with the name Ashishura. Um, the, um, the immoral behavior that's going on in this day, um, God uses this to accomplish hope and to trust in God's plan, even when you cannot see the light at the end of the tunnel. You have to read Esther to know all of that. I'm just summarizing it for you. All right, so after Esther, but next we have um, Job. And he's the only man in the Bible that is born upright and with the Holy Spirit, making him a prophet. And he is used between the bet that's happening between God and Satan, right? Job never wavers from his faith in God. And in the end, Job is more abundant than ever after Satan took away everything from him, including all of his health. His whole body was covered in boils. Can you imagine? Job's faith never wavered. It was, it was unconditional throughout all of his suffering, all of his long suffering, all of his trials and terrors. He was, he was taken through the fire by Satan himself and was allowed to by God. There's something that you need to learn about in Job there. It's amazing, really. Job is, all of my books are my favorite, but, you know, just, there's something special in each book. There's an anointing in each book. Just know that. There is an anointing. And until you really get in, like, for example, the book of Esther, um, until you get in and you understand what's really going on there, 
But what, what all that drama is about, you just, I mean, the word of God is so inspiring and it's done through immoral behavior and slavery and um, it just brutal. <laughs> That's all I can say. Brutal, brutish stuff is happening in the Bible. It's, it's you, you find the light at the end of the tunnel, no matter what, no matter what, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Even though some people think it's been turned off, it's not. Psalm is written by the first man of Genesis 2, Adam. Adam wrote some psalms. Melchizedek wrote psalms. Abraham, Moses wrote songs. Mostly King David and King Solomon wrote the psalms. But there were a, a few other psalmists. Does it matter? It's all anointed. You can't read psalms and not know that it's not anointed. The wisdom in Psalms and Proverbs, Proverbs, by the way, was written by King Solomon, who also wrote Ecclesiastes and Songs of Solomon. All of that is anointed by God. Jesus comes through the line of David. No one's more anointed than David and Solomon. Jesus comes. He'll be called the son of David by two blind men. Remember that? Two blind men sitting there. In Matthew's day, son of David, son of David, can you heal my eyes? And he heals two blind men like that. Remember? Okay, so now from the, um, from the Psalms and the Proverbs and the Songs of Solomon and all that, now we have the 17 prophets that God chose. God chose Isaiah all the way to the end of the Old Testament, Malachi. 17 prophets. All 17 are chosen by God. They're given direct words from God. The anointing is on them. Now, no man has the power at all to add to or remove anything in the Old Testament. It was all completely anointed by Father God. It was authenticated by Jesus because he quotes, he quotes Isaiah and he quotes Daniel. So no man has the ability to take anything out or to add. And that was insured. Again, I'll do a second video. Um, but that is insured in, in uh, First James Day, James of England, King James. And I'll, I'll talk about the history of that and the drama around protecting the Bible. So wh why would we need that kind of drama? Why would you have to be killed? If you were caught trafficking Bibles, why would that be? Well, Satan and his angels are around for this entire event. All of this is taking place and Satan and his angels are hovering over it. Invisible. They're supernatural beings. They're invisibly sitting beside these prophets. All of, the, all of this is playing out. It's all inspired as well by Satan. That's why the Bible is the, as brutal as it is. It's satanically inspired. And God's still right there at the end of it. When you read from a supernatural lens of Satan and God and the battle that's being played out and the, and the war for worship, that's all this is. You either worship a real, true God or you're worshiping the pagan gods that Satan has started building. His empire is everywhere. You can't escape the empire of Satan. You cannot escape it. And you can't find truth in it either. You can't find truth in the church either, except the church of two by two. I hope you know what the church by two by two is, okay? Go read Luke 10. Go look at the sixth letter. Jesus writes to Philadelphia. That's what we're talking about here. I want, I want you to, I, want, I hope I inspire you to go in the Bible and see and read for yourself and let, let God's word ring true and, and, and stir your heart. Yeah. I want you in the Bible. I want your heart to be stirred like mine is every single day. So they started their many religions counterfeiting the word. So everything in the Bible, they have a counterfeit for. There's a ton of Eastern, uh, just, just call it Eastern mysticism, Jewish mysticism, call it whatever mysticism you want to give it, give it to. They counterfeit the entire Bible. There's all kinds of virgin births, a man born of a virgin, um, a man dies, is crucified, and resurrected. Now, none of their gods are resurrected. They can't do that. They can't counterfeit that because that surprised them. 
And the oh, before Jesus came, there's no resurrection. None of their gods are resurrected because they had no idea that Jesus would come and die and resurrect himself and ascend on the third day. He did his ascension was after that. You know what I'm saying? He's resurrected on the third day. That surprised the angel of the devil. Oh man, we got that one wrong. We missed that. Whoop! We well, got over our heads. So, so their old world religions are gone. So they start perverting. In, in about as soon as 55 years after Jesus dies in his sins, in about 55 years, they start perverting the word. They start pervert. They had to change their pagan religions immediately. They had to start changing things. It's like, oh man, uh, we didn't expect the resurrection. What's, what? We, we got off track on that one. So they had a, the old world. The deep church is really way before Jesus, way before that. Uh, Isaiah is telling you about the deep church. Jeremiah is telling you about, okay, Jeremiah is telling you about the deep church. Um, in Jeremiah 44, he talks about, th th these guys have something they're calling the queen of heaven, the blessed virgin, the virgin Mary. Jeremiah is talking about it in his day. Look, these guys have got some deal going on with the queen of heaven. And then Ezekiel in, in chapter eight tells you about, oh, now we got a ceremony that Tammuz, the ceremony of Tammuz. You just have to go read about that yourself. I've spent so much time understanding what the prophets are talking about. All these false, it's like, why? Why is there so many false prophets around Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel? They're like everywhere. It's like, what's going on here? It, the Bible does require some critical thinking skills and some research and a stirring of your heart. What it doesn't need is some pastor, some seminary trained so-called theologian telling you what it means. That's what you don't need. That's what you don't want as you're sitting in churches that are filled with pagan symbols. Filled. And the pastor's giving off hand symbols he knows nothing about. He hasn't read about any of the pagan hand symbols. See, it's been transformed in the seminaries to continue, but we got to counterfeit it. We got to say you're raising your hand to the Holy Spirit. No, you're still paying allegiance to the North God, Anu. I go out of my way to make this so that you who do not have time to sit and read all day long like I do, if that's my anointing, I've been blessed to sit here and read the entire day. From the time I get up to the time I go to bed, I do nothing but read and study. And I've been given the resources, meaning books, the money to buy the books. Um, I still stay in the Holy Bible. I still don't, I hardly ever get out of, out of King James. I hardly ever get out of the Jewish library. Hardly ever. And everything I'm reading to you comes, a lot of it. All of the his Jewish historians, they wrote all this stuff down. You just got to spend time in the Jewish library. It's a huge website. It's massive. There's a ton of information in there. Um, and I'm condensing it so that you can get it in a quick little video here. So pagan religions is about their many gods and their bloody sacrifices of babies. Paganism is also known as polytheism, which means the worship of many gods. All the angels have a cult and they have to be worshipped. They require worshipping. Look, that's why they fell. They lost their eternity in heaven because they wanted worship. That's how addictive it is. Today, it's called idolatry. Well, not today. It's been called idolatry since the dawn of time. God talks about idols and idolatry over 200 times in the Bible. It's the worst thing that can happen. The church is the worst thing that could happen to God's people. The deep church is the worst thing that could happen to God's people. So these dark angel cults, which will counterfeit the Bible stories in a thousand different ways, they will counterfeit the entire Bible. They will have, again, I said it, the virgin birth, they'll have a boy, they're going to have miracles, the feeding of many, the, the only thing they don't have, like I already said, the resurrection of their gods. So they had to start creating holidays. People want to be entertained. People want to celebrate. People want gluttony. People want sex and immoral behavior. That's what, when we talk about a holiday and a festival, that's what's going on. It's gluttony. It's entertainment. So there's gestures, right? These gestures are, are, are roaming around. Gestures really are casting spells, sorceries. Uh, they're binding groups of people together for a certain reason. We're going to get into all that, but that's what these festivals... So they had to start creating all kinds of holidays and festivities 
for the amusement, the entertainment, and the celebration of the people. The energy feeds into the principalities over your head. And it, and it creates this, this, this wizard spell that just, on, on steroids, it just, boom, it just explodes. And everybody's under the spell. Right there's prophets today. Actually, they all have their wizard staffs, and they 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 throw the wizard. They they what do they call it? Circle. They'll circle over their head their wizard staffs as if they're uh what do they what do they call it? Um, I guess rising up of the Holy Spirit. They're mocking the Holy Spirit. They're literally mocking God. They call themselves apostles and prophets. Jesus said, "Go read Revelation two and three. Jesus said, "Look, you're calling yourselves apostles. You are of the devil." You are sitting in Satan's synagogue. It just doesn't just synagogue was the word of the day. Just because you're not in a synagogue doesn't mean you're not in a deep state church. You're in a deep satanic church, period. Jesus calls it out. I honestly don't know how the church got as big. They all got as big as they did because they had the influence and power and allegiance to Satan. That's how that happened. So they, they had their holidays. So let's look at everyday terms that we use here in our, in our life. We're really just a new Rome. That's all we are. We're just Rome transformed. We're the modern day Rome. That's all we are. There's eagles everywhere. This country is represented by eagle. Well, Rome had their eagles everywhere. Rome is the original eagle symbology. But be super clear about that. Their worship of birds in Rome, unclean birds, um, was everywhere. People wore masks, headdresses of ravens and owls and eagles. That's You, you just got to look into the Roman holidays and festivities. Look at the art. We're going to go through art. I don't, I don't have time in this video. I'll try to put all the art symbology. When you had art really started taking off, they had so much sorcery in the symbology and art. You can't imagine. Even playing cards is a symbol. Playing cards. So I'll go through all of the art. I don't think, I don't, just don't have time today in this video, but... Uh, I'm going to try and get as much information as I can out to you so that you can at least um, say a little prayer just going through your days and going through the months because we're all in pagan ceremonies and we know nothing about them. We're all enveloped. It's wrapped around us so tightly. We can't unwind from this. The pagan ceremonies and the pagan symbols and the pagan this and that that's around. We can't escape it. We can't get out of it, but we can pray against it. We can pray to release the principality over our house, over our day, and over our week, and over our month. Because the names, everything that we do, everything that we do, every time we say the word Monday, we are, we are paying allegiance to a pagan god. When we say what month we're in, we're paying allegiance to a pagan god. If we don't know this, because the church won't teach you, church won't teach you, they've been churched away from understanding Pagan, pagan ceremonies, holidays, and the church just just falls right in line. No one wants to educate themselves. I don't get it. I don't. I don't know. I, I don't. I don't know how it happens. But let's look. You know that everything that happens in the deep church today, it's all cult practices. It's all performances. It's religious ceremonies. It's nonsense. It's a three ring circus. But we had the merge today of people claiming, people just self-proclaim, self-proclaim. Every other person now is a self-proclaimed apostle or a prophet, because they have the devil's social media and they make themselves, you know, idols overnight with their long list of subscribers. All right, all of this starts in Mesopotamia in a city called Babylon that starts after the great flood. Only eight people survived. This is in Genesis 9, verse 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. So paganism starts with Noah, son, Ham. And Ham has a son named Cush. Cush has a son named Nimrod. And so it was Cush who turns Nimrod into a Gabor, a mighty hunter before the Lord. Read Genesis 10, Genesis 10, 8 through 10. He was a mighty hunter of men, turned them away from God and unto little g-gods of the angels. And the angels had their hand in all of this. And we are told that by reading Genesis 4 and after that. Once again, the, the Nephilim, the giants, start roaming the earth after the flood. 
So they are a form of a Nephilim. They all together built a tower in Babel. The point here is they went against the command of God. So Cush decided to stay put and have all of his descendants and the, and the descendants of his brothers who may have roamed to where he was in the land of Shinar and the town they named Babylon as they built the tower. They all remain with one language, just one tongue and day in and day out Every living uh, moment of your day was built. Everyone had their part in building the Tower of Babel. That's what the city was about. They did not roam. They did not replenish the land. They stayed put. And so Cush wanted to be in control and keep his descendants under him. And so that is what happened. So... The reason for the Tower of Babel, in case you don't know, is the study, literally, the study of the moon, star, the sun, moon, and stars. And they found the best minds, you know, they found the best intellects of their day, and they were, they were high priests in astrology. So the high priest of the day was because they understood the sun, moon, and stars, the planets, the celestial bodies, all under the, under the name of astrology. That's what we give it today. In their day, it was called... Uh, this something along the lines of uh, the seekers of time. So it's Nimrod that starts the first world religion in Babel. Gen you can read about that in Genesis 10 verses 9 and 10. Jeremiah prophesies on this again as the queen of heaven and Ezekiel as the Tammuz. This is where the occultic religions begin. So so the occult begins here in Babel, Mesopotamia, land of Shinar, and the six religions of the churches that Jesus is against begins here. That's where it begins. Now they had it perverted, they had twisted. Once Jesus resurrected himself, well, things had to change. It was like, oops, uh, got one over us. So Jesus just decades after he ascends back to the Father, has to come to John, decades. John, after his ascension to the seven letters of the churches, and the churches should have never grown outside of the sixth letter of Philadelphia, the mission church, two by two. The other houses, uh, just going to other people's houses, right? Simply for discipleship. But the dark fallen angels have a war on us to worship them. And it's by their power and influence we have the out of control music and idolatry of the mocking God in church today. Let's look at their signs and symbols and control over us. How we cannot escape worshiping the angels unless you educate yourself, which the church will not and cannot um, do because they are under the obedience of their tax free churches. You know, their 5013 C's, whatever that's called. Okay. Let's look at their first holiday. First holiday that they created. The dark angels created. Their very favorite is Halloween, which dates back to a Celtic festival of their god, Sawan, in which the veil between the living and the dead was to break down, allowing souls to cross over. This is also the same festival of the dead in ancient Rome, in which they bought food to the dead to keep their memories alive. Next, Valentine's Day started as a Roman fertility festival celebrating their god Lupercus who protected farmers and shepherds. It was held in mid-February and was called then the Lupercalia um, which was a long held out festival. They had long feast of gluttony. They sacrificed goats and dogs and to ensure a fruitful year they would run through the streets naked flogging themselves with flayed goat skin straps. Sounds very godlike. Birthdays were believed that evil spirits, see, they, they understood evil spirits and demons so well back in the day. The dark angels had them so under their control because of their use of the demons. So birthdays were believed that the evil spirits would arrive on the anniversary each year of a child's birth and attack them. So they would put, they would put on their cakes candles of fire to keep the angry demons away. See, they understood demons in those days, unlike the church today. The demons and the devil has been taken out of church today. Oh, let's uh, take, just take this in. Wedding ceremonies 
and the wearing wedding bands dates back to the third dynasty of Egypt, Old Kingdom, in which the band or the rings creates a binding that when worn on the fourth finger, right, the fourth finger next to the pinky finger, which contained a vein that ran directly to the heart, which was called the medicated finger that was used to stir up mixtures and potions to solidify your spell, your witchcraft, on the heart of the person you were giving it to. The pagan have their witchcraft and spells everywhere, in which they also gave us the tradition of bridesmaids. Bridesmaids in which they were all required to wear the same dress in order to trick the demons to attack them instead of the bride. So the angels were protecting their people by this. That's why the allegiance to the angels is so strong. Their customs, um, their demons, all of this is very real. And it's all cleverly hidden. And we carry on today because the lack of knowledge the church has and all of this damning your soul to hell um, by all this pagan worship. We have always been in the days of Noah. We are never told in all of the Bible that there are other days than Noah. Never once. Take that in for a moment. Just sit with that. All of us think it's something that's coming. It's always been here. A thousand years is a day, and a day is as a thousand year on God's timeline, okay? It's only been two days, all right? Two thousand years. We've been in the days of Noah since the boat landed, guys. It's not something that's coming. Now, it, will it be more visible on the surface? Absolutely. There's a, there's a village in Peru right now that's got seven-foot grays hovering around, flying amongst them. Easter was a Western Manic Spring Festival called Ustor. Uh, that Ustor was a goddess that brings about longer, brighter days for the farming abundance. And, is always, and she always held a rabbit and was surrounded by rabbits. And the egg symbolized the hatching of snakes. While Christmas is a pagan festival called Yule, even Jeremiah tells us, do not decorate trees in your house with glitter. All right, read Jeremiah 10, verse 3 and 4. For the customs of the people are vain. They deck their trees with silver and gold. And yet all the churches and all the cities decorate trees. They cut down and fasten them so they can't move or fall down. Jeremiah speaks exactly on this. Jeremiah 10, 3 through 4. Why do we go against the prophets of God and follow today's prophets' performances? Their lies. Because we are too vain, collectively, to follow God and his word. We need to be lied to, Isaiah tells us in 30 verse 10, which say to the seers, see not. And to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things. Don't tell us the truth. Speak unto us smooth things. We want, we want to feel good. Smooth things and prophesy deceits. They literally, the people are asking the prophets to lie to them. And that is true all around us today. Not one person is speaking any truth, just perverting the word of God and mocking him, which John tells us in 1 John 4, 5. They are of the world. They speak of the world and the world hears them. Now, this is getting too long, so I'm going to go ahead and say in part one, and I'll start with part two. And all God's people said, read the word.